aliens did not build the pyramids. But the ancient Egyptians did have some surprisingly modern conceptions on the nature of the universe. Most of us have heard the stories of Isis and Osiris, of Horus and of Ra, but few have heard of the deities venerated by the scholars and philosophers of Hermopolis, the Agduad. Hey folks, this is James, aka Thresk Humorness. With the popularity of my video on the Ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead, I've decided to dedicate a playlist to Ancient Egypt and produce videos on Egyptian spirituality and magic on the regular. This one is about a group of deities near and dear to my heart, the Agduad of Hermopolis. But before we get started, I think this video is a good excuse to front load our fundraising goals. We're going to Egypt in November, and I'd love to give you a magician's eye view of the ancient sites. For that, we're going to need money for permits and some better camera equipment to truly capture the majesty of the monuments, temples, and tombs. Please go to our Ko-Fi page to donate. A link is in the description below. Though it's difficult for me at this time to provide much in the way of bonus material, I have posted scripts of many of our episodes, which will be made available to those who make a monthly donation. My fascination with the Agduad stems from the fact their major cult center was the city of Kemenu, which the Greeks later named Hermopolis, which was, of course, the primary seat of power for the cult of Jehudi, who we know as Thoth. Recent discoveries in Tuna al Jabal, near Al Ashmunin, the modern city closest to Hermopolis, have unearthed a multitude of ibis and baboon mummies. Kemenu means eight town, and the Ogdawad means the eight. It's no surprise that the worship and mythology surrounding the Ogdawad and Thoth are closely interrelated. As always, when we're talking about ancient Egypt, we're talking about a culture that lasted over 3,000 years and varied greatly from city to city. There are going to be things that I talked about that only apply to a certain time, certain place, and you will find exceptions to what I find to be the primary narrative of the Agdawad. Knowledge of the Agdawad goes all the way back to the pyramid texts. And even then, they were described as an ancient pantheon, perhaps going back to the pre-dynastic period. What's interesting is that many of these deities seem to be a primordial form of deities that became very popular later on in ancient Egypt and had cults of their own. The key word here is primordial. As the Agduad represent forces that existed before the creation of the universe. And they would figure prominently in creation myths that arose in Hermopolis in later periods. They are themselves the forces of creation. In my personal opinion, they represent an elemental system older than the ancient Greek conception of earth, air, fire, water, and aether. Not only that, while the Greeks focused on the visible and the tangible, the Egyptian Agdawad represents forces that are mainly invisible and seem to indicate the Egyptians had a more abstract form of philosophy. As I said before, Agdawad means the eight and is comprised of a set of four couples, male and female. Four was an important number to the Egyptians and represented completeness, Multiplications of four were used to represent eternity. Before we go any further, let's get to know them. But keep in mind, these are my own personal interpretations of these beings, and they are suited towards working with them as a magician. First, we have Nu, who represents the watery abyss. 
Note how this parallels Sumerian and Babylonian myth, where creation comes from the chaos of primeval waters. In some myths, Nu is the father of Ra, and also the source of the Nile, giving him a major role in all Egyptian mythology. I'm going to be a little speculative on Nu's female counterpart. Traditionally, it is said to be Nanunet, but Nanunet is an interesting goddess who is sometimes called Nuit. Yes, that Nuit, who becomes the goddess of the night sky. I believe this is an evolution, as certain Egyptian philosophers saw the night sky as a reflection of the primordial waters, a sort of ocean in the sky. Together, they personify the element of space as an area that everything in creation needs to have a place to be. Next, we have Hehu, whose epithet was God of a Million Years. He represents the yearning for eternity. He is the inevitable passing of time everything that lasts. His consort, Hehut, is the timeless desert, everything that does not change, no matter how much time has passed. Not entirely unchangeable, but the desert will always remain. Together, they represent the element of time. Just like everything in the universe has a place, everything must also pass through time. Without time, there is only stasis. Next, we have the naughty boy of the Agdawad, Keck. That he has recently been embraced by the alt-right makes a kind of sense. Keck is the corrupting darkness, the darkness that is fear of the unknown, the chaos that destroys. Though without destruction, new creation cannot take form. His counterpart, Kekuat, the comforting darkness, the darkness of sleep and rejuvenation, the chaos that is a respite from the crushing demands of order. Together, they represent chaos, chaos that is destruction and the chaos from which all things generate. The best example of an Agduat Didi going on to evolve into a great cult is the god Amun. Amun would go on to become the principal god of Thebes and later combine with the solar god to become Amun-Ra, chief of the gods. From my personal, primordial, elemental perspective, Amun is the unknowable mystery, the genesis that will never be truly understood. His wife is Amunet, who would also go on to have a significant cult of her own. Amunet is the mystery revealed. Also a mystery, but a mystery that can be known. A being of joy, a being of experience. She is in many ways the personification of Gnosis. Together, they represent the spark of life. Similar to Aether in the Greek elemental system, that power which can never be quantified or explained and can only be experienced. It's interesting to note that while the Agduad are quite ancient, their relation as a pantheon of deities seemed to almost disappear for the majority of Egyptian history. Yet somehow, knowledge of the Agduad survived, only to be revived as the main players in the creation myth of Hermopolis no doubt under the influence of the Hermetics, many of which who made Hermopolis their home, as it was known as a place of learning. In this creation myth, the Agdawad, some say directed by the word of Thoth, created a mound in the primordial ocean that existed before creation. In some myths, a goose, a bird often associated with a mun, laid an egg upon the island from which the world sprang. In other versions, the bird was an ibis, the sacred bird of Thoth. In another version, 
a lotus grows upon the island. The lotus, an extremely important symbol for the ancient Egyptians and the most repeated symbol in all of ancient Egyptian art. And from that lotus came Kepri, the god of creation. He's also a god associated with magic. And in some ancient invocations, the magician declares, I am Kepri, created in the flesh. The priests of Hermopolis insisted this was the oldest creation myth in Egypt, though that remains unproven. That the story would survive all the way to the Ptolemaic period is proof enough of their importance. In this later period, the Agdawad were depicted as humans with either the head of a frog for the males or a head of a snake for the females. Many theories have been put forth as to why these animals were chosen. As for me, it seems that both animals represent change and evolution. Frogs start out as aquatic creatures that only later grow lungs and legs. Snakes, of course, shed their skin and grow almost perpetually. Perhaps it was meant to show that creation is not just a one-time event, but is an ongoing process. In my own practice, I use the Agdawad in the same way that other systems would call on the elements. And what better way to make your will manifest than with the powers of creation itself? They are my watchtowers, my gate openers, and the beings that stand guard in my temple. Well, I think that's a good introduction to this fascinating group of deities. Hey, once again, if we've got Scroll of Thoth merch, head on over to our Redbubble store where you'll find Scroll of Thoth logo merchandise and also a couple other cool t-shirts that I designed. As always, like and subscribe, help get the word out, share this on your social media, and thank you ever so much for watching. We'll see you next time.